Hi everyone, my name is Catherine Longhi and I'm the Director of Communication at GIFU, the Global Institute for Evolving Women. And I'm really excited, humbled and honored to be bringing and our very first blog for our conscious business platform, the amazing Richard Barrett. Uh, so for those of you who don't know Richard, well, you should. Um, and you know, who he is, is a, a transformation leader, um, the, the founder of the Barrett Value Center, the creator of the seven levels of consciousness model, an author of over like 10 books, and here's like four of them. And for me, you're the granddaddy of transformation. Uh, so that's who you are for me. And today's subject, well, I'll let you, is there anything I missed out about you, Richard, that you think I didn't cover or? No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on, my I'm on my 13th book and uh, my big new venture is the Barrett Academy for the Advancement of Human Values. So those are the two things that I'm really focused on right now. Yes. Amazing. And the subject of our discussion today is conscious business and the evolutionary business, if, if there is such a thing, um, which I'll be d digging into more detail with you. Um, but if you could just start by warming us up in terms of what conscious business is for you, like how would you define it? You know, what does it look like? What organizations do you see out there? Do you see us operating um, at a high conscious level? So, um, yeah, I think we have to define what uh, conscious means right at the very beginning because um, it's a term that uh, many people are not familiar with. And uh, so we talk about, talk about conscious business like everybody knows what it is. Uh, but I don't think they do. Uh, I think because the, word, the, the term conscious business has to be fitted into a context. And the context is that we live in a world that um, is uh, uh, not operating as well as it could, to say the least. And we want to elevate, we want to elevate the consciousness of people in the world and how they operate so that we can live in a healthier environment, a happier environment, a, 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 an environment which is more full of a sense of well-being. And so when we say conscious business, we mean, well, yeah, I am bringing a sense of my own conscious uh, feelings or my, my higher aspirations, let me put it, to my work. I want to be driven by my values. I want to care about the people who work in, uh, in my uh, company. Um, I want to compare, I want to care about the environment and our impact on the environment. I want to care about the communities where we work. So conscious business means all of that. It means living the best version of who you are in the sense of how you create a better world. Beautiful. Amazing. And doesn't everyone want to live in that? Yeah, I think we all do. We all have that aspiration. And unless, uh, unless we're too wrapped up or wrapped up in our ego motivations, which is, you know, what about me, um, rather than what about the common good. And in your latest book, The Evolutionary Human, you mm -hmm. talk about evolutionary intelligence and the different stages of evolution. Do you see an application um, in business? Do you think evolution can apply to, to businesses, like beyond the people within them? Absolutely, yeah, because businesses are nothing but people um, trying to do the best they can. Um, and so, um, so the, the companies that you really want to work for these days are the, are the ones that are growing and developing in consciousness. Those are, so these are the evolutionary companies. So um, you've got to be able to, so, so many companies just focus on their basic needs, you know, making money, um, getting the work out the door, doing the best job they can. And they really don't care about their, about employees. They don't really care too much about um, their customers, although they say they do, and they don't really care much about society. And so 
that that's not a conscious company. A conscious company will will look will care for its employees, its customers, um, its suppliers too, and the society at large. And uh, is that happening? Yes, more and more. You know, I go back uh, to 1995 when I developed the seven levels of consciousness model and, and created the cultural transformation tools to measure values in organizations and consciousness in organizations. So that's over 20 odd years ago now, 20, 20, 24 years ago. So has there been a shift in that time? Absolutely, there has. I mean, in the, in the 1996, 97, 98, when I was starting my visit, nobody had a clue what I was talking about. I wasn't actually talking about conscious business, but I was talking about values-driven business and values-driven leaders. And it took another 10 or 12 years before some of the big consulting, yeah, there you go. Uh, and look at the byline on that particular book. What does it say, Catherine? It says, unleashing human potential for performance and profit. Um, but actually, uh, it's, it's this unleashing human potential it has all, everything to do with the culture and, 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 and culture can be managed and it can be improved. But uh, the culture of an organization is a reflection of leadership consciousness. So if you want to improve the organization, then you have to improve the leaders. And you either have to change the leaders or the leaders have to change, basically. And I'm curious, um, who do you see as really conscious leaders um, in, in business? Like which organizations and, and which leaders and which organizations do you see as really like leading this? I often get asked this question, like, it's like point at them, point at I them. Know, I know, I yeah, know. Yeah, we all wanna, we all wanna know who they are. Well, you know, um, I learned my lesson on that, not by myself, but by looking at what other people did. And, you know, I couldn't mention it, but you remember there was, I don't know, it was over 15 years now, Good to Great was one of the best books out there. Well, you know, what happened to all those companies who were supposed to be great? They failed. Most of them actually failed. And so here we are, we have a book about all these amazing companies. One of them is Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo was absolutely uh, one of the worst, it turned out to be one of the worst companies around. So when you say, ah, yes, that's the company, just wait a few years. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen. So I hate answering that question. And then people say, well, you don't really know. I said, yeah, well, we'll wait and see. There are some companies, <laughs> there are some companies out there that are doing really well at this. But, you know, unfortunately, leaders change and when the leaders change the culture changes and it is a it's a fact of life and so companies don't have that sustainability power in terms of maintaining higher consciousness so so at various periods you know they are really doing well and then you know uh, five years later they where are they gone so I'm going to avoid that question, Catherine, and I'd like you to move on to the next question. And by the way, I don't think I really answered your previous question, because now I think about it, you were asking about uh, evolutionary intelligence that's showing up in companies. And, you know, um, the, the, the three parts to evolutionary intelligence, you know, when you're faced with a problem that you've never, uh, never encountered before, um, you uh, first thing you try to do is to get stronger and more powerful in order to overcome the threat. Then the next thing, if that doesn't work, the next thing you do is say, well, I'm going to bond with these people who are facing the same threat. And we're going we're gonna to form a group structure. We're going to do better because we've got more resilience. And then the third stage is, oh my God, we still haven't overcome this threat. So let these group structures now co cooperate with each other to form a higher order entity so we can overcome this threat. So so basically, evolution has always been more about bonding and cooperation than about being strong and in, independent. It's, evolution wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had bonding. That's basically it. And you, um, you know, uh, I, you, you recall I did that uh, interview um, not so long ago about the evolutionary woman. Right. Well, he, and I pointed out, actually, you know, women are built for... <laughs> bonding and cooperation. I don't mean physically, I mean, 
mentally built for it. And so, you know, that's why we need more women in business, why we need more women at the head of business, why we need, you know, more women at the top of government. Not the Margaret Thatcher, Theresa May type who uh, uh, took up the first algorithm of evolutionary intelligence and tried to be strong and play with the boys. No, not that one. The, you know, a, a, a lady like the Prime Minister of New Zealand who really knows how to operate with evolutionary intelligence. And that's the sort of person we need in business. That's the sort of person we need in the higher levels of organizations. Wonderful. And I, I love how you brought the angle. I, you brought the woman into the conversation without me even having to ask. I and, like bringing women into the conversation. <laughs> and and with you mentioned uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, who's a, who's a big personal um, role model for me. Absolutely. What, what is it that you see about her leadership that, for me, it's, it's almost, well, it's evolutionary, but it's almost revolutionary because it's just so different from the status quo. What aspects of her leadership do you think are really... Well, this is something I mentioned also when I talked in that webinar about the evolutionary woman. It, it's, a, a, it's a fearlessness, fearlessness. It's her willing to have these fearless conversations. And I think that is the key uh, to uh, running a company. It's like being willing to say, okay, so you're not happy. Let's talk about it. Or, yeah, you've got a different point of view. Let's talk about it. And so having fearless conversations, I think, is a really mature way of handling things. So very often uh, leaders try to avoid those conversations. If you don't agree with me, I'm going to put you on one side and I probably won't talk to you for a few months. Um, uh, you get sidelined. Um, no, this, this characteristic of being fearless, I think, is fundamental to uh, being a leader. And that means courage. Absolutely, that means courage. Like, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be put in a box. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be oppressed. I'm gonna have my say. And I'm gonna make sure you have your say too. So listening I, comes up there. I love so much about what you just said and Recently, like just this week, I interviewed Marie Soprovich, who's the initiator of our conscious business platform on the very subject of courage and conscious business. Um, so we're, we're very aligned in our thinking. And just to um, just to go back to your book, there's something there's uh, what you describe as the Nordic the Nordic secret um, whereby Scandinavian countries in a very short period of time, sort of 30 to 50 years, um, really raised their level of consciousness, really evolved and transformed quite rapidly. And in the business world, you know, you always hear, you know, there's oftentimes a very short, short term view of things. Um, mm. and, and people really wanna move things quickly in business. Do you think that that can be applied? At, and if so, you know, how can businesses evolve and transform yeah. at pace? So, so yeah, the, now the Nordic Secret is a book that describes how come the Scandinavian uh, countries are at the top right-hand corner of every graph and every chart. Um, you know, they're the best at everything, basically. Um, and, and it explains why. And it's because it was a long-term process of understanding that people in their late teens and 20s um, are actually still growing and developing and they put them through the training programs that allow them to shift from what's in it for me to what's best from the common good for from being the best in the world to the best for the world and if you look at the whole scandinavian ethos you'll see that, uh, that there is a, there is something in scandinavia called the law of yante and it basically says you're not to believe you're any better than me. <laughs> so what that's done is, yeah, I know, it's, it's, it's like, oh my God. But you know, everybody in Sweden and Denmark, and Norway, you know, they, they understand, they know about this law. I was just, um, I was just uh, visiting uh, a different part of Italy the other day and I, 
and I was at an old church and there was a couple coming up and they asked me a question. I said, are you from uh, Norway or Sweden? They said, yeah. I said, have you heard of the Lord of the They said, yeah, yeah, we, everybody knows about it. And it's basically, it's, it, what it does is it suppresses these big egos, basically. And it says, okay, if we're going to have internal cohesion, and these nations are very good at internal cohesion, and then we're going to we're going to have to suppress egos, and that's true in organisations too. Um, it's about how do we work together and respect each other, and also at the same time recognise what everybody is bringing together, and, and we can celebrate that together. Um, not um, so, so often happens is that people want to prove that they are the best. No, we want to be able to prove that the we are the most cooperative, we are the most bonding, that we are focused on the common good. That's the key. That is like, I'm just imagining what it would be like in business if the ego disappeared. If, if, because organizations naturally have a hierarchy. Yeah. Um, and like really to just like pretend there's no hierarchy, really, you're no better than anyone else. Like, you're yeah. no better. This is so revolutionary. Yeah, it is. It is somewhat revolutionary. But here's the thing. Um, the, I think the, we have to recognize that um, competence is actually, there is a hierarchy of competence that are, some people are more competent than others. And that's, the, I think that's important because what you want to be able to do in an organization is give the most competent people the most responsibility and and so competence can be a kind of hierarchy but the interesting thing about competence is you know it's not man or woman or favoring men over women it's not favoring old over young um it, it it's not favoring any one particular group it's like who are the most competent people you know right now i'm i'm working on uh a major new book where and I've just analyzed the the um, the consciousness of 145 nations all over the world. And guess what? I'm walking, working with a 21 year old young woman and she is most unbelievably competent in working with spreadsheets, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I just absolutely love working with her. For me, she's like we have this expression in English, she's the bee's knees. She she's so masterful. And I and I and I and I think wow, how amazing to have somebody who's so competent working with me, and and it's just you know we are working together. We're not there's no hierarchy. So yeah, there I think uh, I think you have to remember that there are people who are more competent than others. But other than that, you know, yeah, I'm all for equality. It's amazing. And just to wrap up our, um, our interview today and to really look forward, uh, tell, us, tell us about humanity awareness. Like what's, what's next in your work and, and what do you see? Oh, tell me about humanity awareness in two minutes. In okay. one. Minute, yeah, one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And maybe how it relates to business. Yeah, okay. Well, um, yeah, it does relate to business because, um, you know, over the last, 12,000 years, there have been uh, six major worldviews which have evolved over time. And um, so uh, we go from clan awareness when we were you know, living in caves to tribe awareness to state awareness, through the Romans and the Greeks bashing each other around. And then we went to national awareness and then wealth awareness, which is the paradigm at the moment, at least in the UK. And then we went to people awareness. And this is the most advanced uh, human consciousness there is and we find that in seven nations oh sorry nine nations the the uh, five Scandinavian nations uh, New Zealand Switzerland Ireland and Canada now each time and and so what's next after people awareness what's next after people is humanity awareness we 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 want to be identify with humanity so each stage of these different levels of awareness we we, we increased our sense of identity. So in nation awareness, we're very focused on, okay, my nation is better than your nation, and my company is better than your company, and uh, very hierarchical, etc. And so we move through these different stages, and humanity awareness takes us to a whole new level. And, and, and in fact, what's driving us 
I think now to humanity awareness is the fact that we have this global problem that we can't resolve, which is triggering a new level of evolutionary intelligence. And we can't resolve this problem in any one country because it affects everybody. And that's the climate crisis. And so, so here we have an unsolvable problem from the level of consciousness we're at. And the only way to solve this problem is to move to a new level. And that is humanity awareness. We can only solve this problem together. And in fact, I think people will solve this problem. It won't be governments and it won't be politics because politicians are basically followers. They're not leaders. Uh, and so what I'm hoping is that some of the more enlightened leaders, which you do find in business, by the way, uh, can pick up this and say, and run with it and say, yeah, that's what we need to do. So, yeah, Wonderful. humanity awareness. It's the next stage of evolutionary development for the human being. Yeah, and I, and I liked the, the link back to business because, you know, whatever is created, however people people solve the problems business will be the vehicle because how they you know how you absolutely. get stuff done is through business so absolutely yeah. Yeah. don't don't wait for the theresa may to solve the brexit problem for heaven's sake yeah well <laughs> is she even still there how many <laughs> no <laughs> She's even still there. I don't even know anymore. No. Um, well, well, thank you so much, Richard, for that engaging and brain and heart exploding um, talk. I really, really enjoyed it. I hope everyone watching, you got something of value and all of the resources and references we made to books and humanity awareness and Richard's work, we'll, we'll put in the, in the comment section in the, in the blog below. And um, yeah, hope to hope to speak to you again soon. Loved it. Thank you, Catherine. Bless you and bless everything you do. Thank you.